Hello, you're watching Tech24 on France 24. I'm James Creedon. Coming up on this week's show, tech with a short shelf life. More and more people are promoting the idea of repairing devices rather than replacing them. We'll take a look at a pushback against planned obsolescence. And on Test24, it's been dubbed uh, the Sony Walkman for making. The portable Pi Top 4 computer allows you to design, code and build objects on the go. We'll test it out on set. OK, but first up on this week's show, many manufacturers are uh, increasingly under fire by environmentalists for building products not made to last. It's known as planned obs obsolescence. It translates to more waste, more consumption, more emissions. And there's an obvious and old fashioned solution to the problem, repairing and repurposing objects to give them a new lease of life. This report by Camille Nedelec. In the Paris suburb of Nanterre is this Electrolab, a place where hackers modify electronics. It's not illegal. People here repair things otherwise destined for landfill or give new uses to everyday objects. A hacker is someone who will try to understand how an object works, why the object was made that way, the know-how, to then transform it into something else or rebuild it. This is a kit that is added onto the sewing machine so that the machine can embroider digitally without losing the functions of the sewing machine. It's a hack. You remove it, it becomes a sewing machine again. You put it on, it embroiders. Created almost 20 years ago in the United States, the maker community has slowly but surely conquered the planet. This generation of inventors freely share their digital and technical knowledge. It's a movement rooted in deconsumption, the idea of making do with less to protect the environment and to extend the lives of objects not designed to last. All it takes is a little bit of imagination and innovation. OK, next up, we're going to take a look at the point of convergence between virtual reality technology and Education. Now, virtual and augmented reality can be really effective tools for immersive learning. You can plunge yourself into historical or biological worlds and experience them and learn about them in great, great depth and detail. So is this the future of education? Dan and Jay Kadalkar, our in-house tech guru, is here to discuss it more. Dan, uh, tell us about the more striking aspects of VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality, as applied to learning. Well, James, as you mentioned in your introduction, VR and AR are essentially characterized by immersiveness, by interactivity, and by customization. So you can create uh, environments as varied as, say, the simulation of the principle of Brownian motion, mm. which is an important principle in physics, mm. or to how an internal combustion uh, engine works. Now, that, that's the reason why uh, VR and AR are becoming so important in the field of so this uh, is headsets, education. generally speaking, right? You're, you're, you're kind of not necessarily because okay. AR, you don't uh, need a headset. So just to give you examples, for example, uh, there's this uh, company called uh, Chifu that has uh, developed uh, a smart interactive globe mm. uh, that makes learning geography more fun. Mm. So th it uses augmented reality. So what you have is a dedicated application which is downloaded on an on a uh, tablet. Mm -hmm. Here we have the iPad, and you take the tablet and you scan whatever regions you are interested in. Mm. And once you do that, the important landmarks, maybe it's a cultural landmark, maybe it's something to do with nature, they pop out. Right. And there's this uh, interaction. So you can see here, there's the, the region was uh, India. Mm -hmm. And you saw an elephant. If you go on France, the Eiffel Tower will pop out. So it's... It's a great way of uh, learning it, it because makes, I, it makes it more compelling, more kind of more exactly. present. Exactly. Right. And then for university students, there's another example uh, of the Giza project, which has been uh, developed by um, Harvard. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it essentially is. Uh, it consists of a virtual 3D tour of the Giza pyramids, and it's meant for students who are taking the Egyptology course. OK, now we'll be talking shortly uh, to uh, somebody in the US who is dealing with programs and all sorts of content. But uh, what about here in France, Dan and Jay? I mean, this is increasingly a feature of education. At least people are projecting down the track to where it will be. Where can you actually uh, train 
in this field if well, you want to kind of learn more about this technology? Well, yes, in France too, we are seeing the we're seeing a similar trend. So, for example, the Grand Ecole de Numérique, uh, they have uh, developed an eight-month course uh, for uh, development of VR platforms as well as the animations that go in the virtual reality. And that's in the Paris suburb of Nanterre, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And the important part is that this program is open to people without any academic prerequisites. Then there are two engineering schools uh, in Paris. One is called the EFRI and the other is called AC. Which, mm. have, which also have uh, degree courses in imagery and virtual reality. Now, this is not at all surprising because uh, as of now, we have just spoken about its applications in the field of education, but it has multiple applications in industries. You have uh, applications in the field of medicine, in astrophysics, you name it, and you'll find virtual reality applications. So are pencils, you know, pairers, <laughs> rubbers, rulers, are they things of the past? Uh, well, as you say, it's uh, it's convergence. convergence. So it's the convergence of a headset right. and a pencil. Okay, I, I say keep keep the pencils a little bit at least. <laughs> okay, stay with us, Dan, for the test uh, shortly. But thanks for that for now. Now, immersion-based learning using virtual reality technology requires programs and content. Now, XR Portal is an immersive content library specializing in education. And we're joined now from Boston by John McLeod, its director. Thanks for joining us uh, uh, from uh, Boston uh, today, John. Now, from what I understand, XR Library uh, wants to throw open the availability uh, of emerging technologies uh, to more, more and more people. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so when we were looking at how to distribute XR te technology, I've run a nonprofit for the last 25 years where we tried to make technology available and accessible to everyone. So when we look at XR, which is virtual, augmented, and mixed reality, we looked around and we thought of schools, but schools have a longer, steeper curve to get into from a curriculum base. And even though we wanted to be in schools, we looked around for a public area and public libraries came up as a way to do this. So we approached the state librarian in California and we were able to install over 200 systems in public libraries three years ago in underserved areas with populations so that it was equitable and it was addressable to a large number of, of patrons in the community. From that, we've expanded throughout the United States and Canada, and now we have over 600 systems in 12 states, one province in Toronto. All right, so I, I imagine you would you see this as being the future of education, education being remodeled around the use of technology like this. Uh, and you know, how, how do you think that transition is going to proceed? Well, where, where this is most applicable is if you think of abstract science, you think of math, the, with immersive technology, it's good you can be inside a number, you can be inside a molecule, you can be in outer space, you can be underwater. These these lend themselves to immersive experiences and the research coming in now shows that students have better retention rates, um, they're better at learning and they have more sense of control and agency when they're in these systems. Can you give me an example of how you can be, how, how can you be inside a number? How can you be inside a number? Okay, so one of the programs we work with is called 10K, and it's a visualization tool in VR. So you can look at a number. So if you're trying to, um, they use it for stock numbers. They look at weather data, and you can be inside a virtual or visual representation of that data in, in a virtual space. For example, you can be in, you can look at it from, they have a program called Magnitude 10. So you start off like you're in outer space and then you start reducing the magnification by 10 till you get to a microbiology, a, a nanobiology molecular cell. So you get a sense of depth and contrast in scale in math. I mean, it just sounds so vast, John. I mean, there's so many more questions I want to ask you, but we, we unfortunately don't have a lot of time. I wanted to ask you about concerns about people falling into a digital rabbit hole, but um, I'm imagining we'll come up with ways of managing those risks as well. Uh, very quickly, is that a risk? Uh, well, a lot of people think that it's a very isolating technology. They feel that it's um, because you're putting a headset on and you're somewhere else. But now new software coming out is, is you're able to collaborate with people. You could collaborate with someone in Boston, in New York, in France, in the real time, in a virtual space, where you could be working on a project. 
Okay, we'll have to leave it there. John but McLeod, there uh, so, so, much more, so much more to say on it, but we, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us uh, from Boston. Time now for Test 24. All right, thank you. Okay, Daniel J. Kettlecar, you are going to show us a, a device. It's called the Pi Top 4 portable computer. It might look like a lunchbox there. Well, so that looks like a Sony Walkman, and actually it's been described as a Sony, the Sony Walkman for making. And this looks like a lunchbox to stick with our <laughs> education theme, school theme, but it's not. Tell no, us more. It's not a lunchbox. In fact, it's a box that contains accessories for uh, the Pi Top 4 computer. Now, the Pi Top 4 computer is the latest iteration in the lineup of the computers made by the British company PyTop. Mm -hmm. But unlike their earlier um, avatars, so they used to be uh, laptop computers, this one is uh, more, more small mm. and it is powered by the latest Raspberry Pi, which is the Raspberry Pi 4. So it's now, got a small little screen. It has a very small screen, it's an OLED screen, mm. and only four buttons. Right. So, and you can see there are multiple ports, so you have the Ethernet port, there are two USB ports, there's the HDMI port, uh, and so what does it do? You, you can hook it up to drones and stuff like that. You can hook it up to understood. drones, yeah. you can hook, hook it up to robots, mm. you can also create a customized weather station, you can mm. attach multiple sensors to it. So it has multiple applications and that's what makes it so attractive. Mm. And in your introduction you mentioned about education, so mm. even for children who, want, who are interested in learning to code or who are interested in knowing how an electrical circuit works, this is the, uh, the attachment that I was talking about. So all you have to do is just Click snap it, it. on. Mm. And as you see, there are multiple ports here, so I have some wires. So you can attach some wires. Would here. you need it to hook it? Would you need to hook it up to a laptop as yes, well? Yes, you need to yeah. hook it to a laptop uh, if you want to, you know, put some code in it, of course. Mm. And then, for example, here we have uh, some lamps. Mm. So with the code, you can make this uh, lamp on, right. uh, turn on and turn off. So right. it's a way for students to learn how uh, you can use the code and how, for example, these circuits. It, it just it makes coding and designing and making more accessible and for ordinary people, I guess. Absolutely. Fantastic. Dan and Jay, thanks for that. And thanks at home for watching this week's 624.